Hello, my name is Keshwani. S K E S H W A N I Keshwani. We are here because we want to improve our math skill. Today is our eleventh lesson in a series of twenty on the topic of ratios and proportions. Eleventh one out of twenty, and today is our lesson number one hundred and twenty-six. The problem for today is already on the blackboard. Let's take a look at it. We are told that the tax on a property that is worth sixty thousand dollars is eight hundred. Tax on a property worth sixty thousand is eight hundred. Question is, what's the amount of tax on a property that is worth seventy-two thousand dollars? Pause the video, do it yourself. Once you have the answer, then resume the video. Okay? I'll give you five seconds to do to be able to pause and unpause the video. All right, here we go. There are a couple of ways we can go about it. One way is to simply set it up as a proportion problem in a very traditional way, which is simply tax tax over the value, and we are told that the tax is eight hundred dollars. We are told that tax is eight hundred dollars on a property that is worth sixty thousand dollars. And the question is, how much is the tax on a property that is worth seventy-two thousand dollars? And then cross multiply and solve for x. This is one way of doing it. It is, it is a very traditional way, very academic way. There is nothing wrong with it. Another way we can go about it is simply to realize. It is simply to realize that seventy-two thousand dollars that we're looking at is simply equal to sixty thousand dollars plus twelve thousand dollars. But we already know what the tax is on sixty thousand dollars. On the tax on sixty thousand is eight hundred. And the tax on twelve thousand. Twelve thousand is a fifth of sixty. Okay, follow. Try to uh, stay with me in this story. Twelve thousand. Would you agree? Would you agree that twelve thousand dollars is a fifth of sixty thousand dollars? If twelve thousand is is a fifth of sixty thousand dollars, then it stands to reason that the tax on twelve thousand dollars should be the fifth of the amount of the tax on sixty thousand dollars. Tax on sixty thousand is eight hundred. So on twelve thousand, tax is going to be the fifth of the amount. That's all. We know. We know the tenth of. Tenth of eighty. How much is the tenth of eighty? Tenth of eighty is tenth of eight. Tenth of eight hundred is eighty. One tenth of eight hundred is eighty. Therefore, fifth is going to be one sixty. Or, if you like, you can divide it out. Eight hundred divided by five. If you like, you can divide it out. How many fives in eight? Eight has one five. Eight has one five. The remaining three goes and joins the zero becomes thirty. And thirty thirty has six five. Six fives are thirty. And then how many? How many fives in a zero? Zero has no five. So you see, it's one sixty plus eight hundred. The answer is going to be nine hundred and sixty dollars. This is one way, or you can do it the traditional way. Let's do it out. So x is simply eight hundred times seventy-two thousand. X is simply eight hundred times seventy-two thousand over sixty thousand. That's it. Divide top and bottom by a thousand. They can knock out the three zeros. Divide top and bottom by ten. That knocks out the zero here. And seventy-two. How many? How many sixes in seventy? Let's divide seventy-two by six. Seven has seven has seven has one six. Seven has one six. The remaining one goes and joins the two and becomes twelve. And twelve has two sixes. There you go. The answer is twelve times eighty. The answer is twelve times eighty. And how much is twelve times eighty? Twelve times eighty. Should be ninety-six. Twelve uh, fives are sixty, and another twenty-four. There you go. It's eighty-four and then a zero. Eight hundred and forty. Oh, what the hell? Oh, this is wrong. Twelve fives are sixty, and then twenty-four. Twenty-four represents two eight, not three eights. We need three eights. These are five eights, and we need three eights. I'm not thinking straight. It should be sixty plus thirty-six. It should be 60 plus 36 because 60 represents, as I said, five eight, uh, five five twelves, and we need three more twelves. We need eight twelves. It will be 96 with a zero, at the, and then we get it. Twelve times eight is 96, and then we get a zero. Let's do one more, shall we? Ignore the last part where I messed it up. Twelve eights. I don't know why I made it so complicated. I, I should have looked at it more straightforward way. Twelve eights. Twelve eights. If you have to figure out, twelve eights is very simple. It's ten eights, which is eighty, and then two more eights, which is sixteen. Twelve eights is same as 
10 eighths, which is 80, and 2 more eighths, which is 16, is 96. Let's do one more. I'm going to put the problem on the blackboard. You do it yourself first, and then we'll do it together. Here's the problem. We are told that a solution, a solution is, a solution contains, or has thirteen gram of sugar per one hundred cubic centimeter. A solution has thirteen gram of sugar per one hundred cubic centimeter of volume. Question is question is how much sugar is present in 65 cubic centimeter? And here are the answer choices. See, this is why I try to avoid doing the classical way, the traditional way, the orthodox way, the geeky way, the academic way as much as I can. Just use the common sense, you arrive at the right answer like we did here, break it up into 60 and a 12, and amount of 60 uh, text on 60 is given to us and the amount of 12, uh, text on 12,000 is going to be a fifth of that and you just add them up and that's it, you're done. When you go in the traditional way and if you end up making any mistakes, any mistakes that happens to be one of the most popular mistakes, there's a chance that your answer choice that you arrive at might be one of the answer choices, one of the five answer choices. And if that's the case, if you end up making one of the four most popular mistakes, you will never know that you made a mistake because your answer choice is there. Just use, always try to do the problem intuitively instead of trying to do it in a very geeky way. Do you understand? Let's do the next one here. Here are the answer choices. 3.00, 5 .00 6.50, 8.45, and 8.75. And eight. As I said, do it yourself first before, and then we'll do it together. I'll give you five seconds to be able to pause and unpause the video. All right. What can we do here? Let's set it up as a proportion problem. So we have sugar and the volume. We know we have 13 grams of sugar in 100 gram of volume. The question is how much sugar in 65? That's all. Cross multiply, we get x is equal to 13 times 65. 13 times 65. Let's do it a little bit lower so we have room to work with work in rather 13 times 65 over 100 and at this point we simply have to we simply have to simplify it 13 times 65 over 100 I see 65 which is the multiple of 5 we see 100 which is the multiple of 5 let's divide top and bottom by 5 we divide top and bottom by 5 100 has 20 fives how many fives in a 65 how do I know let's find out 6 has 1 fives 6 has 1 5 the remaining one goes and joins the 5 becomes 15 and 15 has 3 fives. So it looks, it seems like there are 13, 13 fives and a 65 which makes perfect sense because 60, 65 is made up of 50 and a 15. 50 has 10 fives and 15 has another 3 fives. 13, that's it. 13 times 13 divided by 20. 13, 13. 13, 13 is very easy because we know our square, 13 squared is 169. So it's 169 over 20 over 20 but if you leave it as 20, you're going to have to divide 169 by 20, which is very awkward. Let's break up 20 into a 10 and a 2. 10 and a 2. From this point on, you can actually sit there and do the precise calculation, or you can approximate. I'm going to pretend that 169 is approximately 170. So 170 divided by 2, 170 divided by 2, 160 divided by 2 would be 80, so it's 85. It's, this amount is... 
16 has 8, 16, 16 has 8 twos, so the remaining one goes and joins a 0, becomes 10, and 10 has 5 twos. So that's 85. So it's, and, and don't forget that we have another 10 at the bottom. Don't forget that we have another 10 at the bottom. So it's 8.5. 8.5. Now, as I always as I've always told you, it's okay, it's perfectly okay, it's perfectly appropriate to go around approximately approximating things left and right in the exam. Approximate as as many times as you want, any opportunity that arises where it saves you a couple of seconds by approximating, go ahead and do it. It's perfectly okay. However, there is one condition. It's perfectly okay to approximate as long as, as long as at all time you are fully cognizant of whether you are underestimating or overestimating. What are we doing here? Are we underestimating or overestimating? It was supposed to be 169. We are pretending it is 170. So we are overestimating. It's not 170, it is 169. We are overestimating. This amount is over, it's an overestimation, which means correct answer whatever it is. Now that we know that this amount is an overestimation, 8.5 is an overestimation, that tells us the correct amount, whatever it is, this has to be slightly less than 8.5. We're going to pick one answer choice that comes closest to 8.5, but without going over it. We need, we need slightly less than that. Oh, there you go. 8 point. Voila. It's certainly not 8.75. Not only is it oh, it's going over it, but it's going way over it. But what I'm trying to tell you is this. What I'm trying to tell you is that even, even if we did not have 8.75, and even if you had 8.55, and we had to choose which one to pick, we came up with 8.5. Which one do we pick? Do we pick 8.45 or 8.55? Well, the answer is we pick 8.45 because we realize that's an overestimation. I'll see you tomorrow, okay? Bye now.